Welcome to the No Fear Podcast and the No Fear Live Broadcast. I'm your host, Tony Lauer. If you're into mindset training, performance psychology, personal development, you'll dig this new format. No Fear Live is a unique broadcast and it's different from the No Fear Podcast. We decided to go live because we wanted to create the opportunity to interact with people like you all over the world where anyone can log in and ask questions and in some cases, you may even get invited into the show. The great thing about the live broadcast is that it's much more personal for the listener. That's you. Remember, self-defense isn't always about a confrontation with someone else. The first and most important fight is winning the one inside your head. Hey, hey guys, can you guys hear me? Something just happened with my mic. Sean, can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, I can. All right, buddy. All right. At least everything good on your end, guys. We're just having a little technical issues issues here, but I think we're good to go. Sean Stevenson, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing better now. Get well, to hang out with my guy. Yeah, well, um, I'm excited to have you on here. You are like one of the hardest guys to get on a podcast. And uh, uh, it's just exciting to, to, to finally have you here talk about your your work your body of work um just i don't know if you've done live stuff before typically i mean obviously you've done live stuff before but you do a lot of studio work i decided to go live with these uh we never know who's going to log in and ask a question we then share this all over all the normal all the normal uh, uh channels you know apple spotify and all that stuff but what's amazing is about 15 minutes towards the end we looked at the audience and see if who's got questions and then you can interact and we can pop their questions up on there so it's kind of a neat way to involve the world while we're having an important conversation so uh, those of you who are listening from around the world please you know in the comments uh, check in tell us where you're from and get and get ready to uh to listen and learn i have a bunch of questions that i hope I hope I ask you some things you haven't been asked before. And uh, and and it's a little intimidating having you here, even though this is the No Fear podcast, and I've got my, my Fuck Fear sign in the background. Uh, it's a little intimidating, dude, because you're a master of this. Like, your podcasts are are, are epic. What are you ranked? Like, uh, like, number 372 in the world? What's what's the ranking of the, of the model health for our audience? So the show, it's kind of like the billboard charts. You know, right. we've been the number one health podcast in the country. Uh, I mean, probably a hundred times. Only the number. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then just overall, we've been in the in the top 10 of all podcasts, literally in, in well, in the United States. Um, and it, it's just crazy, you know, coming from where I come from. I didn't do this in the hub of health. You know, I'm from St. Right. Louis, Missouri. I'm from the heartland. Right. One of the most unhealthy states. Ironically, a lot of hard problems in the heartland, but yeah. this just shows the power of this medium, you know, to connect and to educate. But, you know, most importantly, in a, in a platform like this, it's being able to make connective tissue, right, to actually make it relatable, entertaining and, you know, getting folks to tune into this versus, I don't know what people are listening to. Uh, that, I don't know. Right. Bon Jovi or whatever is, I don't know, man. No disrespect to Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi, Sean. Right. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I was there, man. I'm an yeah. '80s baby, you know. So I was living on a prayer before, you yeah. know. Nice. No, so <laughs> it's funny because you you intuitively answered or started to answer one of my questions, which I was going to lead to later. But let's hit it now and keep the conversation organic. What made you like start a podcast? What was the what was the, and and you could have started any podcast. So tell uh, you know, my, and my audience is mostly law enforcement, military, active duty, retired, martial artists, fitness nuts, um, uh, uh, obviously people who like, you know, super funny guys because I'm hysterical, so they like comedians. Um, but that's that's my audience. And so your, your, I mean, your pillars and your books, your your books are about, I mean, your original book, uh, or, or, you know, on, on sleeping, uh, yeah. sleep smarter, uh, eat smarter. Uh, and I don't want to, I don't want to screw up some of the questions I'd written out for you, but how did you get, so how, when did you start the podcast and how did it start? Cause it's again, being number one for, for a long, long time in America me, makes it huge around the world as well. 
Yeah. You know, sometimes you don't know what your secret recipe is yourself, you know, just because you're so busy doing it. Yeah. And I think it's because I have a very diverse background, you know, working as a clinician for many years, as a nutritionist, having a proclivity towards speaking and teaching classes and also, you know, my conventional education and then my much more expanded education outside of my university. And on top of that, being an author and having the opportunity to, you know, my most recent two books are, uh, they were the number one new releases in the country when they came out, USA Today, national bestsellers, all that good stuff, which again, coming from where I come from, that shouldn't be possible. Right. But I'm saying all this to say that, you know, being a writer, being a speaker, being somebody who's worked with people one-on-one, -on -one, which you know what this is about, to look in someone else's eyes and say, you know what, I've got your back. We're going to figure this out together. And so, but, and this is the, the last part, doing that through the lens of a research scientist, mm -hmm. that's my primary thing. That is what I do every day. I'm, you know, looking at journals. I'm communicating with the top people in their respective fields, talking to different scientists, finding out what needs to be known by the people who, that, who don't usually find out this information because they're published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And right. it's just like, it's speaking to, to, to other academics versus people that can get tangible, life-changing information right now that's based on science. And so as far as the show is concerned, pouring all that into that medium and the way that it started, actually, I was speaking at an event in Las Vegas, a TED, a TED event, a TED talk. This was like 2011, I think somewhere around then, 2011, maybe 2010, but it was around that time. And after I finished doing my talk, this couple came up to me and I had actually been introduced to them prior to doing my talk. And you know how you meet people, it's just like, okay, it's cool, you know. But after I came off stage, they were like, wait a minute, you're, you're different. Like, that was amazing. And they were telling me, and we were just literally just having a conversation. They were like, we just started this podcast and they told me about their... They have this huge wellness site at the time. And I was trying to reach more people online because I was at the time I was working as a clinician at my office in Clayton, Missouri, seeing people one after the other each day. And I, I was speaking a little bit and teaching classes. And so when they told me that they had like, I think it was like a million unique visitors a month or something like that. I was just like, what? I've got like 10 people coming to my website that I did like a Kevin Costner approach to it. Just like if I build it, they will come. Right. You know, field of dreams. But that sure. did not happen. Uh, but now they've got this medium and I just wanted to serve. I just wanted to find a way to help folks. And they told me, you know, we just started this podcast and we were looking for somebody to like be the 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 face or the host of this podcast. And we was they were like, you know, we would love to talk to you about that. And I was like, that would be amazing. Let's go. But in my head, I'm like, what the fuck is a podcast? <laughs> like, I didn't know. I didn't know what it was, but I'd already like kind of verbally signed on to do it, even not knowing what, the, what it was. But, you know, long story short, I was I, I came on board and I ran that podcast really top to bottom, except the distribution of it. I handed it over to them. I did everything myself. I recorded it, it was my laptop. And I just my wife, because I shared this story one other time okay. me, last year, because I was using the same Yeti mic all huh. these years later. Until yeah. like a month ago, she just got me a new one. Nice. Right? So I have my laptop, this Yeti mic. I learned how to use GarageBand. And that podcast had hundreds of thousands of downloads back in 2012, I think, or 2011 when it, when it actually officially started, which at the time that was astronomical. Right. But, and we did that for about a year and a half. And, you know, again, it was my wife. She was like, I'd been working and building these folks brand all this time. And myself, and this is the unique aspect of this, again, I still had a barrier of being completely authentically myself because I'm still through this lens of academia and professionalism mm -hmm. and all that stuff that I perceive to be what, what worked there. And so that's when we started my show, The Model Health Show, which we're moving into our 11th year now. But here's the cool part and why, just to speak to everybody, you know, when we go into stuff that we might feel called to do or inspired by, but there's that voice in our head that we're not going to be good at it or, you know, that it suck. Even when we start to do the thing, we suck at it. Mm -hmm. And there is an initial suck. There right. is an initial suck component to things as you figure out. But the faster you can be authentically yourself in that thing, that's when your unique capacity comes out. And so 
I got to work out some of my kinks on that other show. And as soon as I started my show, we just hit the ground running, man. Right. And literally, and this is this true, totally true story. Every single month, Tony, thousands of people go back and start at episode one. And we have like 750 shows and they start from one and work yeah. their way all the way up. Thousands of people every Amazing. single week because we could see the numbers. We just see it. Right. But I feel some stuff like you have your old work and you're just like, I hope nobody ever sees right, it. Right, right. I feel 100% confident in people taking that journey. And I see the journey continue because I was being authentically in my power and all my skill sets and my ability to communicate were just there. Uh, in that fear, in that in that moment, but also as you mentioned, over time I've just gotten progressively better. You know, sure. just being able because I'm always looking for mastery. It's and, and I'm and mentioning that it's kind of like the Billboard charts. You know, it's like there is this thing, and 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 I, I think it's kind of unfortunate, but a lot of times it's just like, what have you done for me lately? Like, okay, yeah. can you do better than your your last hit? Right? What? Well, let me see your sophomore album. Right. Yeah. And we're trying to outdo what we did previously. But what I want to celebrate more, and I encourage this in everybody, it's like being able to celebrate your classic moments, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to like use that as fuel to know what you're capable of as you move forward. And so I've been really seeking that, seeking that mastery, seeking that ability to connect at a different level because all of this stuff matters, but it doesn't matter if people don't feel like they're, it matters to them. You know, like it actually makes that connective tissue to land. And last part of this, by the way, what is the catalyst for it? Well, you know, when I initially went to to college, I, I didn't know anybody that had ever went to college, let alone graduated from college. That just wasn't something in my environment, you know, growing up in the inner city in St. Louis. And, you know, even this the past year, St. Louis was the murder capital of the United States. And so I lost a lot of, you know, family members, whether it's prison, whether it's, you know, uh, victims of violence. The, the, I grew up during the crack epidemic. You know, there was one time when I lived literally next door to where crack was being cooked and sold out of this place and losing family members to that as well. And so not really having models of what was possible. And I went to college under the, the, the premise of doing what I saw on television, which watching things like, you know, watching the Cosby show or something like that is like, oh, they look happy. He's a doctor. I mm. should do that. And there was one episode where like he was having a, a some kind of a weird, probably a flu dream or something. And uh, him and the other men in the family were giving birth. And, you know, Phil Hux, I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> it's his a weird character in this day his, and age, <laughs> his character was giving birth and it ended up being like a huge foot long sandwich or like 10 foot long sandwich or something crazy like that, whatever. But I was just like, man, being a doctor is awesome. Um, and you know, the wife was a lawyer and all the things, and it's just like, I should do that. And so I went into my university. I went to this private university in St. Charles, Missouri first, and they had a great pre-med program, but here's the thing. I hated, I hated mm -hmm. science. I hated it. I hated everything about it. I didn't want to go to class. I didn't want to go to these stupid labs. I hated it. And so after my first semester, I got out of that program and transferred to the business school. But mm. fate had other plans for me, if you want to look at it like that. Because at, at the age of 20, after being part of the reason that I got to go to a university, being a scholar athlete, was because of all of my athletic endeavors, you know, like high school. And I ran a 4 five forty right right after my 14th birthday, wow. you know, and so I'm you know, at, uh, aspiring athlete in football and in track. But at track practice that year, I broke my hip from running, which is very unusual for a kid to break their hip yeah. from running. And then fast forward. And I, I, after that, I experienced about half a dozen more injuries. I just couldn't stay healthy. My body was falling apart. And eventually by the age of 20, I was diagnosed with this so-called incurable degenerative spinal disease, degenerative disc disease at the age of 20. Jeez. I had severely herniated L4, L5S1. Both of them were herniated and I was in a substantial amount of discomfort, which eventually became chronic debilitating pain. And I was just a kid. And when I went to the doctor, he put the MRI out for me to see. And I was just like, okay, so what, what do we do to fix this? 
And he was like, he literally pumped his hands like this, like, slow down, son. What you have, this is this is called degenerative disc disease. And you're, uh, unfortunately, you have the spine of an 80-year-old man. And this isn't something that you can fix, son. I'm sorry. You know, this is one of those situations where, you know, um, unfortunately, it's incurable. And, you know, we're going to do the best that we can do to help you to manage this. And my young mind, and I didn't think that I had any context for asking him this, but I understood later. But I asked him, does, does this have anything to do with what I'm eating? Should I like exercise differently? Like, what can I, like, mm -hmm. what can I do? And he looked at me, he cocked his head and looked at me like, he looked at me like, you're an idiot. Like, right? you, like listen, he said this. Yeah. He said, I'm sorry. He said, this has nothing to do with what you're eating. I wow. said this already. I'm sorry, son, but this is incurable. This is, this was the key words, Tony. He said, this is something that just happens. And I'm sorry that it happened to you. Now, being where I am today, almost 22 years in this field, we have a principle in physics of causality. In our, at least in the dimension that we live in, in th this dimension of this universe, there isn't things that just happen. There's a cause and effect. There might be pocket dimensions or different realities where that is does not apply. But in, in our reality, we don't we see causes but we might not, we see effects but we might not know what the right. cause is that doesn't right. mean the cause doesn't exist right and so to fast forward the story he i left there with you know a slew of different medications and for the next two years from the age of 20 to 22 i was suffering deep deep dark place and i gained a bunch of weight i was now in chronic debilitating pain and this is a time where i get to actually share this because i'm here with you I was in fear 24 seven. I was in fear of literally standing up because the pain was so bad. I did my very best to stay seated. And that's mm. what I did for the next two years. I was in fear and I was in, there's a metaphoric aspect to this as well, because I was literally af afraid to stand up for myself, mm -hmm. you know, and it's because I, I didn't, I didn't know the fear. I didn't understand what I was dealing with. And so I just hid from it. And it's not like my character. My character was that of somebody who is a fighter, who has this very like, I'll figure it out personality. But at that point, after all those years of suffering and fighting, and at this time I'm living in Ferguson, Missouri, and I'm trying, I'm trying everything I can to try to graduate from college. And one thing after the other just keeps on happening. And so once I got the permission slip from him that you can give up, I took mm -hmm. it. But that wasn't my story. That's the thing. And it took two years for me to, to step up and to take accountability and say, this is not, he told me what my story is. He doesn't walk in my shoes. Right. And from that moment, I decided, I don't give a shit. I don't care what anybody says. I'm going to get well. Whatever it takes, I'm going to figure it out. And I had that kind of audacity and that kind of fire that was always there that I had muted. And now I'm just like, nothing is going to stop me. And but most of the time, Tony, you know this, we don't make those kind of firm decisions. It's more like, I'll give it a try or wishful thinking, like we'll figure right. maybe, you know. No, no, no. I it's like the burn the boats, I don't care, nothing is gonna stop me. And going through that process of getting well, which of course we'll probably dive into during this conversation, but three very basic things for human health and epigenetics and really changing how my, you know, my 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 genes were getting expressed through what I was eating, through my movement practices, which were null and void at the time. And right. through finally, if you're not sleeping, you're not healing. And actually being able to improve my sleep quality, six weeks after that decision, the pain I've been experiencing that had me in fear of standing up was gone. And I'd lost about 16 pounds at that point in six weeks, which is not typical. Mm. But fast forward nine months later, when I got a scan done on my spine and my two severely degenerative disc now like that were black on the MRI previously. Now we could see the light shining through them. Wow. The two herniation, herniations have retracted and the physician was standing there. This was the third physician at this point, holding his chin, scratching his chin, just looking at the MRI. He was like, whatever you're doing, keep, keep it doing up. it. <laughs> keep it up. Like huh. I haven't seen results like this before. And he asked me what I did, what I've been doing. And I told him, but he didn't really take it in. Sure. Because for him, that's spontaneous remission. 
That's all it is. We don't know how it happened. It's spontaneous. Right. But that was the birthing of my career, Tony, because people at my university started coming up to me because I didn't look like a person who just lost weight. I looked like a person who was radiantly healthy from somebody who was mm -hmm. outwardly like I look like a ghost. I look like somebody who was severely unwell and people were coming up and asking me, can I help them to do what I did? And that was the birthing of my career. And that's the last part of the story and how the podcast became successful. Because I don't have that thing in the back of my head that something is impossible. And when we're talking about health and all of the fucked up things that is happening with our health today, we don't need more people telling us that we can't get well. But this is coming from the perspective of somebody who is given this so-called incurable, you can't do anything about this uh, kind of uh, messaging, which is a nocebo effect. And for me to, to personally overcome something that was supposed to be impossible... Right, And to have that underlying every single one of my words as I'm communicating on this platform, that was the other thing that really made it very, very special. Wow. So I have a million questions now because of that. I'd, I'd never heard any of this and uh, uh, insane, an insane story. One thing that that one of the reasons I think, no. I shouldn't say things. One of the reasons I know you're so successful is, I mean, I, I've had the, the the pleasure to meet you socially a, a few times, and you are you radiate good human. There's and and I I and I think it's because and I keep saying think now that I know this backstory. Before I knew the backstory, the first time I heard it is this. Let me back up. I was going to say why your show and why people relate to you is because you're smart enough to go through college, smart enough in terms of self-awareness to realize I'm not going to continue in, in this uh, uh, profile, in this profession, because I hate it. But because you, of your fascination with, with athletics, with coaching, with, with working with people, you're able to read the scientific American shit and go, well, this is pedantic and obsequious and nobody knows what pedantic and obsequious means. So I'm going to say it to them. You got this. And let me tell you what you need to do. Um, the, I remember cutting my hand open at camp when I was 15 years old and the counselor takes me to the, uh, to the uh, doctor's you know, headquarters in, in a summer camp. And I'm like freaking out because it's it's a bad cut, but it's not bleeding, but it's weird. I can see inside my hand and I'm like, oh, do I need stitches? I'm doing this. And the doctor goes, uh, well, ah, that's a good one. Were you playing with a knife? Yes, sir. Um, I don't think you'll need sutures, but definitely we got to get a topical antibiotic on there as soon as possible. And I'm like, and I'm looking like this and the my counselor looks, he goes, do you mean some first aid cream? He goes, yeah, but like the doctor had to make it sound like uh, sutures and topical antis, like, and so a lot of the people they do that you don't do that at all. You, you've got the vocabulary, but you immediately rephrase it in language that people can relate to. And 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 initially, I went like that's so much. You're likable. You're articulate. You've got the vocabulary. But hearing, like I've had. I've had so many injuries from my combatist career, and and those of you and a lot of people who listen, uh, listening to this, this is an interesting actually show for everyone listening to this, because I've had a couple of uh, pain management specialists on, like everybody who's a combat athlete, who's a military law enforcement actively retired, has back and neck pain, knee pain. We we whether it's from jumping out of an airplane or being in battle or getting kicked in the head. And we're all looking for so it's it's a it's a chronic. A lot of us don't sleep well. Uh, a lot of us don't eat well. And and uh, who was it that said you know the first medicine was food? Was it uh, Hippocrates? Right. Um, and just the idea that a doctor would say to you you can't change your diet even though like that's like that's like do no harm. Food is medicine. <laughs> like, like it's just amazing. Uh, uh, it looks like you want to yeah. hear something. There. So this is this is also bringing everything full circle. And thank you for mentioning that because what what the difference was with me hating science was that I was disenchanted by it because it was so like 
it wasn't applicable to me as a human being in the real world. Right. All right. When we're in biology class, again, I'm paying a lot of money. I'm going to this expensive private university and we're in biology class and we're getting taught about the, the human cell. And we're looking at the different parts of the cell. We've got the mitochondria that's basically printing out our quote energy currency, right? Making ATP for us to like run processes. We've got the nucleus of the cell. We've got, you know, the, the cell membrane, right? Around the cell, giving it, giving it structure, but also the membrane, by the way, that's a big point of communication for other cells. But we're, we're learning about all these parts and we're getting tested on this, but it doesn't apply to me as a person because there's a break in the understanding of my professor in the field of science and in particular in health and medicine, because there's a break in the understanding that when we're studying that mitochondria, that that mitochondria is made from our menu. It's made mm -hmm. from what we're eating. When we're looking at the nucleus of the cell, it's made from the nutrients that we're eating. We're not, we don't have the connective tissue, the aha moment to realize that we're looking at food. Huh. We're looking at the food of ourselves. And also when we're, you know, in labs and we're dissecting different things, what we're looking at is what that animal has eaten. It is food. It is all the result of food. So to say that it doesn't matter is, mm -hmm. be, it's beyond ridiculous. It doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever, but that's not the way that we're taught. We're taught this unconscious belief is unconscious bias that stuff just happens. Mm -hmm. This cell just happens. It just shows up. But the reality is, and now again, I'm so grateful of just kind of being in this field at this level and continuing to connect with high level scientists and thinkers. And I know the top cardi cardiologists and they've won all the awards. They've, they've got the TV shows. They're doing all these things. But when they're in medical school, they're not taught that when they're studying the heart of their patient, their arteries, their blood, that they're looking at their patient's food. Their mm -hmm. patient's heart is made from the food that they've eaten, the makeup of their blood, their arteries, their capillaries. It's all made out of the food that they've eaten. And if they've not given their body the raw materials to make those tissues correctly, the great thing about humans and other species as well, but we are incredibly adaptable. We, our bodies make adaptations that we label as diseases. Mm -hmm. One of those adaptations, for example, that's become an epidemic is type 2 diabetes. When we're exposed to an abhorrent amount of glucose that we've never evolved having access to, our bodies make an adaptation to help us to survive under unideal circumstances, period. But we label it, this is what it is. There is no cause, by the way, right, right. or... Now we're becoming more, more active in saying like, this is the lifestyle related version of this condition where we have the beta cells and the pancreas are, you know, they're still printing out insulin, but the sensitivity of the cell is gone. Like we can break down the pieces and understand how our diet can influence it. Now we could say that, but previously that wasn't really even socially acceptable that this condition was caused by your diet and it can be fixed by your diet. That would leave out the opportunity for drugs. That would leave out the right. opportunity, which have their place. Metformin, insulin. These are multi-billion dollar industries. Multi, multi-billion dollar industries. And they're dependent on you being sick. Yeah. And so, by the way, there was a study. This was published uh, about a decade ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. So, again, this news is not new. And this is one of our top tier peer-reviewed journals here in the United States. And the title of the article was uh, effectively 200 years of diabetes. And they looked back at all the documentation of 200 years of diabetes. And it was consistent for over a century, for a century and a quarter. Then once we got to about 40 years ago, something happened. 40 to 50 years ago, the rates of diabetes since that point to the, the end of that that meta-analysis quadrupled. Wow. They quadrupled in our population. And yet we have these silly terms of, you know, this is genetic. This is, you know, if this was genetic, this would have been happening. What has changed is not our genes. What's changed is the environment. And so our body's making that adaptation. But here's what, what I wanted to say to bring this all full circle is now I have this deep, as you could tell, passion 
and love for science because mm. the connective tissue is mm. there. It makes sense to me as a person why the cell matters. I admire the human cell at a level of, <laughs> at a level that's a little freaky, all right? The, this this science is really, I have a deep, a deep affection for, because for me, I see the world now through the lens of science. Everything mm -hmm. is this dynamic interplay between all these different things. And I love it. I'm obsessed with it. And that is what I strive to do for other people is mm -hmm. to create that connective tissue to so you understand why this matters. And it isn't something superficial because in our unfortunately in our culture, like we are we think very superficially about health. We think health has to do with as I did fitness, a lot of it, you know, maybe there's some biomarkers we might pay attention to, you got high blood pressure, whatever, but a lot of it has to do with very superficial things. Mm -hmm. And so bringing this to a place where we understand that we have the power and we know that when I decide to, to eat this food, that the power isn't just in my hands, the power is also at the end of my fork. And, mm -hmm. and I get to choose what I'm making my tissues out of. And this is the most important part, Tony. That choice does not have to suck. That choice, unfortunately, again, when I was trying to get healthy and lose weight when I was in college, slim fast. The commercial said mm -hmm. a shake for breakfast, one for lunch, a sensible dinner and starving myself basically and having mm -hmm. these nasty, highly refined synthetic versions of these nutrients. And I believe that I had to suffer, that my suffering was me losing weight and getting to where I wanted to be. Eating delicious food was no longer part of the, the, the process. It wasn't on the menu anymore. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the biggest lies. It is one of the most unfortunate things that we have to suffer in order to achieve health. Those two things don't even, those right. aren't even on the same frequency because humans, we have this very dynamic palate. And part of that, Tony, is like, we also have a very, and we don't think about this because we're not like, you know, canines or whatever we could sniff out you know uh cocaine at the airport we that's we don't have that kind of a nose right we have one of the most remarkable uh abilities to sense smells of any creature this is why we can taste so many different things in food is because of our sense of smell it's hmm. so remarkable there's this powerful interface between our sense of smell our tastes and also our sense of hearing as well and as a matter of fact there was this really cool a study, it actually won a Nobel Prize, which is so crazy. Like, again, a lot of people don't hear about this stuff. This was an Ig Nobel Prize, by the way. So it's like a different category. Um, but it was called the Sonic Chip Experiment. And the researchers, basically, they found a food that had a consistent density. And, like, they all kind of just looked the same, which was Pringles. All right. So they're trying to find something that's very consistent. And what they did was put headphones on the study participants. And they would turn up certain aspects of the crunch for certain study participants. And they found that when it had this amplified crunch, the study participants felt like the food was fresher. They felt it was 15% more tasty and satisfying because that crunch through our evolution indicated freshness. Mm. There's a big difference when you bite into a crisp apple versus a mushy apple. Mm -hmm. That mushiness is an indicator like, hey, this has probably gone bad, right? And so all of those interfacing and this dynamic dance leads to something that we are driven to eat things that taste good to us, that have textures that we enjoy, sounds that we like. All of those things matter. Every animal in nature, if you've ever thought about why do they eat the shit that they're eating? Why does that animal, why does that lamb eat that? Why does that uh, you know, crocodile eat that? Like animals are eating things that taste good to them generally. Mm -hmm. And we have this internal intelligence as well, but here's the rub. Food scientists have absolutely manipulated those pathways and our desire mm -hmm. to eat tasty, delicious things. But villainizing the fact that we like delicious food, is that that's wrong because that's against biology. Our biology is wired up in a way that we eat stuff that we like. And so my mission has been, you know, I've been in this field, I'm getting close to 22 years, has been to Let's deliver the reality, which is like, we love delicious food. Let's lean into that. Right. But let's re-educate, reorient our, our nation, our world 
to remembering what we already knew, what our ancestors already knew, which is real food, real food that we've been having for thousands of years actually tastes fucking amazing. And the, our best food experiences are usually those experiences. We don't usually have like super memorable times of eating some Doritos. Like, you know, like back in, no, no, it's usually a beautiful, real food meal prepared by somebody that you love or a high end, like, you know, a chef, somebody who really knows their way around a kitchen because real food can taste better, feel better. All mm -hmm. it checks all the boxes. But the last part of this, Tony, is we're so far removed from that. And not, I'm not just saying it, it's based on the data. And so the, the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, this is top five peer reviewed journal in the world. A couple years ago, they published a report, a meta analysis, and it uncovered that. In the United States right now, 60% of the average adult's diet is now made of ultra processed foods, not processed foods, mm -hmm. ultra processed fake food. 60% of our diet, humans have been processing food forever. If you cook a steak, it's processing it. Mm -hmm. If you press the oil out of the olives, it's processing. If you make tomato sauce from tomatoes, that's a processing. Those still are close in proximity to where they come from. They mm -hmm. still have a natural essence. Ultra processed foods, on the other hand, is when you have a field of wheat that somehow, some way becomes a box of frosted flakes. That somehow, some way, that field of wheat becomes Pop-Tarts. Right. That field of corn becomes Pepsi. That field of corn becomes Lucky Charms. It's so far removed from anything real, we do if you were to pre present that a bowl of frosted flakes to uh, a, a hunter gatherer tribe, right? right. The Maasai, for example, right? You say, where did these, where did this food come from? They're going to look at you like you're from yeah. another planet because there's no evidence that this is anything real or natural. Not to mention all of these newly invented synthetic compounds that we know now, and we mm -hmm. can dive into some of this if we have time riddled with, documented carcinogens that means yeah. cancer causing agents this new category which is not really new but more people are now hearing about it of obesogens these are obesity causing agents that supersede this ca caloric management uh kind of subunit of science we have epi caloric controllers and other compounds that are proven to cause all manner of mental health issues chronic diseases increase the risk for infectious diseases the list goes on and on it's and there are foods. thousands of those compounds in our food supply right now. And so the la last, last part, I mentioned the BMJ for the adults. For our kids, it's far worse. And the, my new book, The Eat Smarter Family Cookbook, I'm honored to say this. Yeah. But also, this is a call to action for everybody. This is the first book publishing this recent study looking at ultra processed food consumption by our children. This was published in JAMA. This is the Journal of the American Medical Association. The researchers tracked food consumption of our kids for the past 20 years. In 1999, the average child in the United States diet was already 61% ultra-processed fake food. By 2018, that number was almost 70% of our children's diet today as ultra-processed food. And in the, the most recent about 30-year time span, Childhood obesity has tripled in the United States. Is that not a coincidence? Is that? Yeah. We've got to start making the connection and take our power back. We've got to take our power back and also create conditions to protect our kids from this nonsense because the, the, the moniker, the modus operandi of many of these processed food company, companies, by the way, my nutritional science class at a, at a university was funded by General Mills, mm -hmm. top that's tier ultra processed food company. What do you I'm think sure they're going to tell people to eat? I'm sure that's an accident, right? You know, I, and it's so again, but their credo is lifetime customers. Get them while they're young. The marketing to children is their primary source of revenue. Long term is getting kids hooked on their products. And again, I'm so done with this. I'm on a mission to change this. But the, the bridge has to be, Tony, it has to be through 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 deliciousness. It has to be through joy. Mm -hmm. It has to be through celebration, all the things that feel good to us. And not only is it possible, this is something that we've been able to replicate over and over and over again.
I, I got two thoughts on that. First of all, like the evidence is compelling. Uh, you know, what's going on in the last three years has just exposed a nightmare of shit that we can't talk about that much or, or we'll get canceled. Um, uh, but the, the, if everything you're saying is true, we know this and, but like when you put everything up on a whiteboard and you connect general mills and you connect big pharma and you connect government messaging and you connect the commercial, you could easily, without the tinfoil hat, go, these people are all working together. And and it's insane at, you know, what they've done. Because if you got a, a kid who's going, mommy, I want more frosted flakes. I want more. And, the, and the mom doesn't understand because she doesn't get the education that you're giving. She wants the kid to stop bitching. The kid is freaking out because he's addicted to sugar. You want that to be quiet. Then the kid gets diabetes, but don't worry, Big Pharma has a fucking, you know, medication for that. And then you've got, again, this only happened uh, a couple of terms ago where uh, one of our presidents says it's okay to now uh, propagandize market uh, drug information to Americans, right? And, and it's just mind-boggling. We can go back to that. I was, I, I, but I had a question for you. Two things. One, uh, I wanted to say this. If you said to me, here's all the evidence, and in order for you to stay healthy mentally and physically, you're going to have to eat this food, and it tastes like shit, but you're going to be uh, less likely to produce any disease, live longer, less inflammation, be a better athlete, be a better provider. I would tell people like working out isn't easy. You just fucking, there's some workouts that have to be hard. And, and I would say that even if the food that we needed to eat because of the disparity between like the, you know, the, the, the paleo phase to the process phase was now going to be shit. I would say you got to go for it. You got to go for it. Well, you can't change. You can't choose easy over healthy. Um, but what you've done, and I've 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 seen you eat, and I've 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 seen the book, and I, and I was uh, I was actually we were sitting beside each other at dinner recently, where somebody who follows you came and shared a story of how uh, you, your message and your research and your book had helped somebody very close to them, mm. uh, and what it was mind boggling. It was like food is medicine, um, but for everyone listening to this, like. You all know people that are just eating like boiled chicken and and white rice. And that's how they're and that's OK. But imagine if it tasted great, too. Yeah. Right? So what you're what you're alluding to is the fact of like there are people and you and I are in that camp. I'll do whatever it takes. Right. You know, like you you tell me that this thing and it it tastes terrible, but I'm going to get I got I, let's go I'm try. I have that willpower element. And I know that there is only a small fraction of our population that can subscribe to that, you know, yeah. to have that level of willpower. And you mentioned working out, for example, like when I said suffering doesn't equal health. No, no, no. I mean, some of that, you know, right. you could you could suffer through some of these elements with training. But those who are doing it at the highest level that have the most grace when it comes to training, for example, they found a way to fall in love with it. They mm -hmm. found a way to dare I say, enjoy it, enjoy that, that, that. So the suffering, like for, I, I love training. I love training. I love it for other people. This might feel difficult or hard yet. I do. I feel that, but right. I love it so much. It's nothing to me. Like let's, let's go. Right. Yeah. So what I'm, what I'm talking about here is being able to create that bridge to where we find the joy in the thing. And part of that and part of that love for training is finding things that I love to do mm -hmm. that get all these different benefits. Right. So sometimes you got to take a little bit of the, you know, the, the medicine to get certain results. So maybe, you know, I love to train, you know, deadlifting and like, you know, sled pushing and pulling, whatever. But just getting under the bar and squatting, even if I can't functionally, I can functionally do it might right. just be like, you know, I hate that. Maybe I get a little bit of that in the mix, right? But yeah. the majority of my exercise diet is the things that I love. And also I'm thriving. I'm at a different level. Yeah. And so and we want to bring that same 
kind of perspective to food, right? So there might be those small things where it's like you got to pay to play. But overall, we're finding those things that bring us joy, that we love, that also hap help, happen to be fucking awesome at the same time for getting the majority of these results. And so that special kind of uh, blend is where we have something like, and this is, uh, I stopped working with people one-on-one -on -one in my practice. I started working with families. I stopped working with people one-on-one -on -one in businesses that might have a job. You know, they work at US Bank, they work at Google, right. whatever. I started working with the organization. Right. I've been there, done that for years. And I find like, what is the connective tissue for all these people? And doing this from the perspective of growing up here in America, in one of the most kind of quote glorified food deserts and understanding, hey, listen, I got McDonald's is right here. You know, Burger King's right here, Dairy Queen, Papa John's, the list goes on and on. This is the majority of my diet. When I mentioned those numbers with kids, you know, 70% of our kids diet almost being ultra processed food. If anybody knows anything about research, there's people at this, the, the low end and at the high end. All right. That's the average, the high end. There's going to be kids that are 90% plus. Right. That was me. And so one of my, one of my favorite things, which I know a lot of people have a resonance with was McDonald's breakfast food, mm. sausage, McMuffin with eggs, the, the, the hot cakes and sausage, the, the egg McMuffin, the sausage biscuit, put a little jelly on it. All right. These things start to conjure up some nostalgia and some vibes, but knowing that that's a highly refined, ultra processed flour, even to make those quote hotcakes. What yeah. if we made a delicious pancake that had a basis of a real food, mm -hmm. like sweet potatoes, for example, right? So sweet potatoes, that color that we might see, there's a variety of sweet potatoes, but what the researchers indicate, and by the way, I shared all of these studies in the book, there's over 250 scientific references, but there's anthocyanins, these really remarkable compounds in sweet potatoes that have been found to specifically target the memory center of our brain, the hippocampus, and potentially enhance our memory, all right? Mm -hmm. the, the resistance starch potential there is wonderful for improving the diversity of our microbiome. I can keep going on and on and on and on about these benefits. A lot of us have had a baked sweet potato. Cool. Maybe we get fancy and we have a sweet potato hash somewhere. But to make pancakes with sweet potato is a mm -hmm. game changer. All right. Mm -hmm. We get the sweet potato vibe because also it's not just not just the fact that, you know, it might taste really good, but also we want to have a certain flavor experience. In addition, we want to have a certain texture experience, all those things. So I was really working. And again, I'm a I'm a big foodie. I'm a nutritionist, but I love food. Mm -hmm. So I'm working to increase the protein fraction, right? So it's not like a high, like we, because a lot of times if you want to eat pancakes and you want to be a high performing person, you got to just only eat the pancakes on a day that you're able to take a nap yeah, because, yeah. you know, you're going to have the glycemic spike and then the crash. But what if we increase the, the protein fraction and we use the basis of a, like a real delicious food? And that's what we came up with, you know, so we have these sweet potato protein pancakes in the book, which are very, the thing is another apprehension that I had so, and a lot of my friends and family have cookbooks out there, you know, friends and colleagues, some of those recipes are too complex. This is geared towards family. This is geared towards simplicity. So even when we're making up a batch of these sweet potato pancakes, which we're actually making, uh, if not to, tonight, tomorrow night. So sometimes we could do breakfast for dinner, right? But we're going to make up a, an additional batch where, where we can freeze them. And then my youngest son, who's 12, can heat them up in the morning and grab him some fruit and have that for breakfast, getting a nice protein ratio, getting some high quality uh, fiber and all of these micronutrients in this real food form. My, my son is fueled at a different level. And yeah. you've seen my son. You've seen beast. my son. He's a beast. All right. My body was breaking down when I was his age. All right. This kid is the tallest kid on his basketball team in AAU, he just turned 12, all right? And he is literally at a different level. Like, he's like a cheetah running down a gazelle. Like, there's all, just from this last week, this basketball tournament, I didn't, tr I didn't tell him to do none of this. It's just the output, mm -hmm. these epigenetic inputs that he's getting, and he's getting this kind of higher order functioning out of his genes, out of his DNA, out of his potential. 
and he's just at a different level and it's remarkable he and he just started playing basketball a year ago he's playing against kids that have been playing for years amazing and in this tournament that they just won he's a defensive player of the tournament he's been playing for less than a year he had i don't know 10 steals they went into overtime and they had like it was like maybe about a minute left and the other team was driving up the, our team was up by two points but it's still close they can come down and score he steals the ball runs it in go gets a hard foul at the rim it doesn't doesn't get the and one but he goes to the free throw line and sinks a couple of shots that put them out of range for that right. victory right Proud it's that. just like <laughs> these are the things that are possible for our kids i'm not trying to listen last part here is like we do need to see this though we need to see these examples mm -hmm. because people need to know that my son is not by accident right. right and also they need to know that it isn't because he is special it isn't because there is some superhuman capacity that he has other people don't have. There is a focus on creating a healthy culture where it makes it easier for him to be his best. Mm -hmm. We're creating a healthy microculture in our household so that healthy choices are easier. It's just what we do. His movement practices, all these different things, it's just a part of what we do. Right. I worked for years trying to change the macroculture out there, and I'm grateful to say I've had some impact. But- that can be a severe waste of my time because the real power is you create enough models and examples of what's possible. Families taking control and, and being empowered within their own household. It is infectious. Disease isn't the only thing infectious. Wellness is infectious as well. And we go outside our doors and it is contagious when people have the example to see what's possible. When they see, I purposefully made this project so people that they can come into our household see my family especially again coming from a, a low-income environment that i come from we don't get to see examples like this and for people to see what's possible and to start to replicate that and tony i was just studying you know malcolm gladwell tipping point mm -hmm. uh, just recently i just finished rereading the book this morning actually and funny enough malcolm gladwell as i'm saying this stuff like listen man it's, it could seem freaking magical because there's no well, way Malcolm Gladwell should know who the hell I am. Right. We have the same publisher huh. and he did a spot for me for his show, recommending my show wow. out of his mouth. So when I'm saying, when he's talking about tipping point, I'm in a different, like, I understand that at a whole different level. I'm not just saying that because the shit sounds good, but we are very close despite, despite appearances, to reaching that tipping point, to normalizing health. There are these massive movements taking place, but one of the things that's holding us back, Tony, is a lot of infighting. It's a lot of infighting by people that are working towards this change because everybody thinks they're right. And we're infighting about minutia, like this diet's better than this diet. And this is amongst people who care. When the reality is we all need to collectively be working on the fact that Ronald McDonald is beating the shit out of our population. Mm -hmm. Like most of our citizens are eating ultra processed food every single day. And I'm saying that because that's what I was doing. If we collectively work together on that, that's when we, again, we're, it's already happening, but I think we can reach, reach that tipping point faster when we stop being so divisive and we be more inclusive in our diet frameworks and looking at the things that, that, are common amongst us that unite us that we can all agree upon and focus on those things. And then we could talk about the minutia in our little inner circles, but if we're going to change this bigger picture it's going to be through us working together. I agree. I got, I want to be uh, uh, respectful of your time. It's uh, six minutes before we're at an hour. And I had a couple of things here that I had to ask you. Um, so I'm tracking everything you're saying, and it it resonates. I mean, it resonates with uh, uh, everything I try to do with fear management. I'm I'm telling, you know, it, when you start to understand fear, and you start to get to know fear, K N O W, you improve your self awareness. If you improve your fear management and self awareness capacity, it automatically uh, uh, amplifies your critical thinking. They go hand in hand. And if you've got better critical thinking and better self-awareness and better fear management, you can look at external stimuli and go, 
oh, that's weird. They're going to give me a donut if I put this experimental shit in my body. That's weird. Maybe I should do a little bit more research, right? Uh, you know, so, it, and I always tell people, like, parents, we need to teach our kids <clears throat> how to understand and manage fear because they are the future. Uh, and uh, so this resonates with our philosophy perfectly. But I've got a couple of questions and you... It's almost like you had my you read my notes because you're answering them in parts as you're as you're doing your little soliloquies. Uh, I recently saw a a highly regarded uh, subject matter expert online who asked the audience if they knew what the number three cause of death was in the United States. There were a couple of guesses, but he said no. It was medical malpractice, uh, 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 misdiagnosis, psychogenesis. Like yeah, and and you know that. Uh, uh, heart uh, heart disease and cancer were one and two, but medical issues like people screwing up in, and that when you think about that, and then you think about uh, Hippocrates and do no harm, food is medicine, get your sleep, fucking work out. We all need to take extreme responsibility for our our health, physical and mental, and our family's physical and mental. Um, so if those numbers are, are, are accurate, that should not just scare you, but inspire you into friggin' doing the research on this stuff. Now, to your point about people working together, there's a zillion influencers online that say, it doesn't matter what you eat as long as you're in a calorie deficit, blah, blah, blah. And while there's mathematical truth to that, and I'm nowhere near the uh, SME that you are, I've always said, you know, 500 calories of chocolate cake doesn't have the same value to you as 500 calories of broccoli, right? And and uh, uh, understanding what's smarter to put in your body is huge. So my question is this, with all the SMEs out there, how does somebody, you know, they listen to you, they go, this is compelling, but this guy said this and this guy said this. How do we, how do we vet that and make, a dec and make decisions on what protocols to follow or research? All right. Well, we first have to understand that, you know, and I'm saying this from the perspective of these are my friends. These are my colleagues, the top face of whatever diet framework. I know these guys. Right. All right. And I could tell you a lot of the time they're not 100 percent subscribed to the thing that they've become the face of. Okay. Um, but some people are. They're very adamant about their thing, but they're coming from the perspective of service most of the time. So I know the top vegan physician and the top carnivore physician. All right. And everything in between. These are my friends. And collectively, they've seen people become well on their diet framework. But what you don't hear about is all the people who don't become well, who don't get the results. And we've got to put this in its proper perspective. You know, a lot of times, the vast majority of the time when somebody is subscribing to these diet frameworks, they're eating more real, minimally processed foods. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of it, especially if they're following a practitioner who knows their shit. All right. right. There, that is that is a big part of the reason people start to feel better, but they attribute it to it is this keto diet. It is this paleo diet. Now I'm saying I'm not disrespecting or disregarding any of these things. These are all my friends, all of them. You know, with paleo Rob Wolf, that's my guy. Like, right. And so, but what it is is we have to understand. And again, Rob has even it's not just paleo for him. It's right. like What's appropriate for the person right now? Because somebody taking that carnivore protocol who's been struggling with an autoimmune condition and they've tried, quote, everything, everything under the sun, they've done a vegan protocol, they've had the all the things, but they cannot get well. They cannot stop the suffering, whether it's colitis, whether it's Hashimoto's, whatever it is. And they try this carnivore diet and they finally feel well. And it's been a decade since they've had a good day. It felt good. You cannot tell them that that, diet framework was not effective for them. Right. The same thing holds true on the opposite end if it was a vegan protocol. And so I'm saying all this to say that all of my friends and colleagues are both right and wrong. They're mm -hmm. all right. And also they're wrong if they think that this is the end all be all perfect human diet, because that doesn't exist. What I want to encourage people to do, and this is the, the, the secret solution that shouldn't, shouldn't be a secret is we've got to understand that humans have tried to eat Every fucking thing, everything you can right. imagine from freaking, you know, chalk to bat shit to, 
you know, every animal that you can name, of course, like we've tried to eat everything. That's one of the things that makes us really cool as well as a species that we have such a diversity of things that we can eat and potentially thrive with. There is no other animal remotely close to this. And so to ignore that is part of the problem. Right. And the secret that should not be a secret is if we simply honor and understand the fact that we evolved eating certain foods for thousands upon thousands of years and to suddenly villainize any of those foods is just inappropriate. Yes, they can be wrong for some people at some times because, and here's another shout out to Hippocrates, right? In, in our framework of conventional medicine here, there's the Hippocratic Oath because it's so distinguished. Right. This father of modern medicine that nobody really gives a shit about what he actually said or how he practiced. Hippocrates said that all disease begins in the gut. Mm. Was he just off his rocker? Was he just a moron? Should we be taking the, I don't know, the, uh, I don't know, uh, Stephen king Ocratic oath now, you know, like, should we take a different right. oath? And so I don't know why I said Stephen King. Because <laughs> this shit's scary, man. It's right. scary. All right. So in, in, with that being the case, what is happening in here, what you put in here is of the utmost importance. And somebody's microbiome could be in a place where they can't tolerate some whatever up uh, some some rice right oh, they can't tolerate some chicken they can't tolerate some eggs that is okay for that person to avoid that thing but to villainize the egg that humans have eaten for thousands and right, thousands right. to this day you come across a hunter gatherer tribe or something close and they come across an egg they're eating that shit right. and their cardiometabolic health is so astronomically better than than most people here in the United States and but we villainized the egg right mm -hmm. or the chicken or the quinoa or the you know the the fruit whatever it is we've got to check ourselves and this is this is the to take the takeaway piece is if in doubt ask what humans have been eating the longest mm -hmm. that's probably going to be a good indicator that this food is going to be better for you than a fucking hot pocket than you know, a ding dong. But also here's the thing too. This is what I think makes me a little bit different is I can't villainize the hot, the hot pocket either, or the ding dongs. They exist. Right. We do want to point out that they're a little sketchy. All right. If you eat the ding dong, you might not be at your best. Right. But it still exists. And humans have created it from elements here on earth as highly refined and unnatural as it might be. We still made it and it's still edible. And it might save your life in some context. You know, you might end up on a deserted island or something, and it, all you got is a box of of ding dongs, and it can keep you going. Right. So we don't want to villainize it. We don't want to give the context right. that it has its appropriate place as well. But if you want to thrive and be your best, it's probably not a great fuel for you to have on a consistent basis. And so my point being that everything is an option. We have to be mindful of what works for us right now and don't put yourself into a diet framework box that might imprison you because mm -hmm. something that can help you to perform at another level is not in that diet framework or that diet framework is telling you to eat something that is actually keeping you unwell yeah. and so the most important piece is paying attention to what our ancestors have eaten the longest and even if you got some proximity just looking at your close ancestors right maybe you have heritage from greece maybe you have heritage from Japan, maybe you have heritage from Kenya, whatever it might be, if you've got a grandmother, great grandmother, whatever, inquiring and, and, and bringing to life, what were they eating? Because your unique genetic makeup, mm -hmm. there's nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics. There's nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics. One of these fields of science, which again, unfortunately, a lot of people don't know about, but this is why we're doing this work, is stating essentially that every bite of food that you eat changes your genetic expression. It is an epigenetic controller hmm. that can alter thousands of your genes, the potential for one gene to print out up to 3,000 different proteins, 3,000 different copies of you based on one bite of food. 
That's fucking powerful. Crazy. But there's nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics as well, which is the other field is based on your unique genes, there are certain foods that just work better for you right. that lead to more desirable gene outcomes or gene expressions. Because I'm saying desirable because when we when we feel good, when we're performing at a high level, it's not to say that there is a gene that's coding for a disease. When we have alterations, again, I said this earlier, that we have a disease symptom, that's just an adaptation. It's an adaptation. Most of us are born with relatively good genes. We only have about, there's, and this is one of my, again, I'm very honored to say this, my mentors, Dr. Bruce Lipton, cell biologist, he really pushed epigenetics into popular culture. Mm -hmm. And he shared with me years ago, and then being able to look at the data myself, less than 1% of the population has a true genetic defect that they're born, they're born with this problem, right? Even if we're talking about something like type 1 diabetes, for example, that's, that would fit into that camp. Most of us come here with pretty good genes right? and our epigen, our environment, our exposures, our choices are what are influencing our level of health. And him re reorienting to me that, Sean, we don't have disease that code, we don't have genes that code for diseases. They're coding for expressing symptoms that are often guiding us to change. Mm -hmm. There's environmental inputs, internal and external, that are guiding us to like change from that behavior because it is hurting us in some way, right. but our body is adapting to continue to function under unideal circumstances. And so just to put a cherry on top of this, looking at what were your ancestors, if you got close proximity that you can study, because all my years in working at a university, I got to work for, with people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. There are these principles that it's a common thread. There might be different foods, but there's a common thread all over the world on what people were including. Most of these foods were very close proximity to their natural source, all right? Yeah, we can cook, we add spices, we jazz it up, yeah, bada bing, we do all the things, make it taste amazing, yes. But you could still tell where that food came from, all right? That's principle number one. Another little interesting thing I'm just gonna throw out here, which I, I didn't plan on sharing this, but mm. every culture, every person, in that, you know, whether I talk to somebody from Ethiopia, from India, from Paraguay, from England, from Ireland, didn't matter. And I got to work with people from all fr France, uh, South Africa. Every person in their culture ate a cultured food. There's a mm -hmm. cultured food in every culture. And I was like, man, that's really, regardless, pe these, these people were thousands of miles apart as far as their proximity mm -hmm. in tribes through their evolution as a, as, a, as a tribe. And yet all of them were eating some kind of fermented food that's, is that like indication this would probably be good for us right now right. to have some kind of fermented food? And so there are these common threads we need to honor. We need to ask ourselves, you know, have, have humans been eating this food for a substantial amount of our history? Or is it a newly invented ultra processed food that really I struggle to even cause, call it food because it's so right. far removed and highly refined and all of these synthetic chemicals have added to it. That is really the thing that we want to move away from. So my encouragement to people is shift the ratio at minimum. Just shift the ratio. Our average here in the United States, 60-40, ultra processed foods, 60%, 40% real foods. Shift that ratio. Go 60% real food. Mm -hmm. now, the Twinkies and all whatever can still be there, all right? But if you really want to thrive and be at a really high level, that minimum effective dose for me is 80-20. Right. And we could debate on these ratios because I'm kind of this is very superficial because we're all so unique. But just focusing on making the majority of your diet real, minimally processed foods, but transform these into delicious meal experiences. And again, because this is inclusive, I've got a grass fed burger for you that's, that's going to knock your socks off. We've got a salmon burger that is probably my favorite food right now. If somebody's prescribed to a pescatarian approach. We've got a vegan burger, veggie burger for your vegetarian friends right. who are stopping by and you want to get them off the bullshit, ultra processed, you know, uh, vegetarian burger patties, because the truth is they probably still want a burger. All right. Uh, but and they're trying to find that kind of flavor sensation, but we're making it with a with a with 
real foods. So everybody's invited to this party, right? And so, you know, we have the science back foods, over 40 specific, most science back foods for improving your metabolic health, your sleep quality, your, 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 your uh, emotional stability, stability and mental health, all backed by science. But then we make delicious meals out of them. Mm-hmm. And also with the family focus so that we can even, you know, batch cooking. You know, I just made this chili, for example, on Good Morning America a couple of weeks ago. And the 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 staff there at Good Morning America was flipping out. Mm-hmm. They act like they never had a chili before. But right. it's because of these incredibly delicious ingredients. And sometimes like that's the only recipe in the book that is actually a, a more of extensive amount of ingredients because we're making a big batch of chili so you right. can freeze it and heat, reheat and eat whenever you want. Everything else is pretty minimal as far as the ingredients, just to keep it simple, to keep it cost effective and to invite families into this transformation. I love it. Let me uh, let, let's wrap up with with uh, with this. Um, f- also, you know, the way you created the recipe is the way I create self-defense recipes. So I love it in that I don't just say, hey, do these push-ups to help with your punch. I'm like, here's a scenario that got you on the ground. This is the, you know, your understanding, the neurobiology that put you there, the kinesiology, the psychology, connecting it to the emotional will to fight. And so when you do one push-up, you're actually, you're actually inclusively thinking about four or five reasons and it's almost like the chili metaphor it's like you're not just making chili you're going this particular thing is going to help me with sleep this is going to help me with inflammation and it's so you're it's like interleaving in the neuroscience there's five things going into it so i dig i dig the whole thing buddy um i'm super excited uh uh and and proud to call you a friend and uh and and learn from you i i messaged my wife after i said you gotta listen to this shit because uh, uh, we've got to start uh, cooking out of your cookbook um, and and get that. Because that's how my brain works too. I love I love all of that, and I love how you've taken the uh, you know the, the the science of like tactile, the the crunch, that the research of what's the, the the sound, the smell. And I've eaten at some pretty nice restaurants. I'm a bit of a foodie too, and and you take a bite of something and you're like, oh my god, you almost don't want to finish it. Uh, because it tastes so good. So when somebody understands a good recipe, that changes also the experience. And I love, yeah. I love that it's a family thing. And I'll tell you, everyone listening to this, like I've had dinner with Sean and his family and watched. I was going to make a joke because I was sitting there at dinner and uh, I'd had a, a, a long day and I've got a sweet tooth and I'm eating my dessert. Jay Ferrugia sitting beside me, eats his dessert. I look over Sean didn't have his processed food. That cake just sat there. And I was like, oh, damn it. I'm sitting beside the master and eating like a glutton. Um, Anyways, it was, it was, it was funny. It was funny. And I gotta, I gotta jump in here and say this. You, you, uh, Jay has sweet teeth, not just a tooth. Cause he ate, I think he ate mine. He ate some of the Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also it's just like, I'm not coming from a place of restricting myself from, from enjoying that moment. Right. I was really, I think I was in a conversation or something and right. I, I had a really protein dense, like I, I had extra yeah. because I even ate my yeah. wife's. I think I had maybe a, some kind of a, of a steak and then she had some fish. Like I was really just on that. And right. also I know that if I'm going to eat a dessert, I'm going to eat something for myself. Most of the time, something that's higher quality yeah. so that I could just still have those experiences. By the way, Tony, make the cheesecake, make the okay. cheesecake, okay. the hey. bread pudding, but the bread pudding is my wife's favorite recipe. And it is, I'm not saying that it is super health food, by the way. Right. Higher quality ingredients, absolutely. But not I could not I'm... put my wife's favorite recipe in the book. We got to live. Um, do you have a minute to answer a question from one of the audience? Let's go. Let's go. Okay. So Mark asks, uh, thoughts on fasting, intermittent, et cetera. You see it up there? You see yep, the- Yeah, uh... I see it. Yeah. Intermittent fasting. So this phenomenon has become kind of a popular part of our culture recently, and that's awesome. Um, humans have been doing this for a long time again, you know, like this is not something new. This is one of those things that our genes expect us to have times when we're not eating. We live in a society now, and I actually share one of these studies in one of my previous books, looking at like actually monitoring people's food intake and just seeing what people are eating through the day, how frequently they're eating. And what the research has found is that the average person is eating 
in, in about a 15 hour time span through the day. All right. So most of the day there's food involved. Mm -hmm. And what they did was simply consolidate their window to eat 10 to 12 hours a day and no other restrictions, no micromanaging calories, none of that stuff. Their sleep improved. They lost weight. All of these satiety factors and cardiometabolic factors that they were tracking, many things improved simply by consolidating the time that they were eating. And so even something as simple as having 12 hours of what you eat, which is can be eight in the morning to eight at night. It's not right. hard. Right. But, you know, and then having that 12 hour of fasting, which includes your sleep, that is enabling processes like autophagy to take place, you know, a deeper cellular cleansing and just like being able mm -hmm. to help remove metabolic waste products. There's an improvement in cognition. If we stretch fasting out a little bit longer, we see some bumps in, you know, things like human growth hormone. There's all kinds of things. But as with anything, they can get overdone and they can be used inappropriately. And so, and by the way, this is coming from respect perspective of somebody who I'm not just saying this shit. Like I've done a 21 day fast. Mm -hmm. All right. I've done, I've, I've done, I'm not talking about anything that I haven't done myself. Mm -hmm. All right. I've done water fast, multi-day water fast. I've done all kinds of stuff that I wouldn't want to go through again or want anybody else to go through just to actually test and experiment. Yes, I know the data but I'm going to see what it does as mm -hmm. a human being and report back to you. And so intermittent fasting, I think is great for pretty much everybody, but in the context of this doesn't have to be a four hour eating window. There are different flavors of what that can look like. I think right. a good healthy 12, 12, because that's when the research has found that there's this, there's this, they call it a quote, metabolic switch takes place mm -hmm. where there's all these improvements in metabolic health with just even a 12 hour fasting window so but it's just the fact that the language starts to mess us up with that we're fasting no we're just you know i'm not eating at late at night because that fucks my sleep up and it's just i don't feel as good and right. you know i'm not losing weight and all these different things it's just like i'm eating from eight in the morning to, to eight at night is when i finish eating and then that's that you know everything else is you know so it's not a very strict rule but because we put fasting on it sometimes it could be very complex but there's a lot of interesting benefits you don't have to go too far. Things can be situation appropriate. And, you know, I love, I've, I've used intermittent fasting. I wrote this book basically during my biggest fasting window, to be honest, uh -huh. and, you know, improve cognitive function. But this doesn't mean if I'm hungry, I'm, I'm going to eat something. Right? right. So, but generally for me, myself personally, with intermittent fasting, the past six years, most days, not all days, and that window can be anything from a 12 hour to 14, 16. It just depends on the day. It just depends on the day. The ultimate place I want people to get to is to listen to your body. That is truly the best blueprint that you can get. All these diet frameworks are great. All of this wonderful health advice is great. But once you can listen, tune in to what your body is telling you, and you know this, Tony knows this so well, listening to your intuition, that inner guidance mm -hmm. system that unfortunately is downplayed on how real and how important. And one of the things that makes us most human, we start to listen to that in the context of, of safety, of, of being able to prevent negative things from happening, creating a culture where we can avoid a lot of problems, but also in the context of creating radiant health within our bodies as well. Listening to your body is the ultimate guidance system. Take it. Dude, I know you got to go. I need you to stay on one minute after we sign off. Um, what's the best fit place for people to reach you or to get your books? Website? What do we have, Elisa, ready to pop up here? So I just found out earlier today that this is the number one new release cookbook on Amazon right now today. And this is weeks after it's been nice. released. Congrats. And Amazon has dropped it $10 off the list, list price on Amazon right now. So I just found this out today, which is awesome. I can't control what Amazon does yeah, because yeah, yeah. the book is doing so well. And I encourage you. Comparatively, go and look at the Eat Smarter Family Cookbook and look at the reviews for that book. Look at the reviews and you'll see there are a plethora of people who are making and posting the recipes. I didn't ask anybody to do that. Right. And you go compare that to people who have cooking shows and all these things. People are not making and posting the recipes. There's something really special about this book. There's the, the, the deliciousness factor, there's the ease, there's the health, there's all these different things where people are excited about this. 
and they're just blown away that they just made this delicious food and they want to share it with people. On, on so your something really special. So Amazon, on, Barnes and Noble as well, online retailer or your favorite bookstore as well. Go to Barnes and Noble or a local bookstore. You can pretty much find the Eat Smarter Family Cookbook anywhere that books are sold. Okay, man. Um, I appreciate you. you. You gave us 20 extra minutes. Uh, go follow Sean on uh, Instagram. Where are you most popular? Which social media? Yeah, Instagram. I'd say Instagram. Okay. At Sean Model on Instagram. Yeah. And uh, uh, I also appreciate how uh, courageous you were over the last three years, speaking your mind and trying to educate people with with uh, the shit show that is our current world, uh, and and what you're what you're doing, your message, what you're doing, and trying to get people healthy, out of pain, uh, uh, more resilient uh, through food. Food was the first medicine, guys. Don't forget that. Come full circle. Go get the book. Follow Sean. I'm going to I'm going to sign off here before we get any more questions. Sean, stay on in the background for a minute and uh, stay safe, buddy. I can't wait to see you. Uh, we got to I'll be up in L.A. to visit Nikki soon. I'll hit you up a minute before it's time to go eat. <laughs> I, I always give you inside joke as I'm always up there. Go, hey, let's go eat. You're like, dude, I need more than five minutes notice. OK, I'll speak to you soon. Stand by. Thank you, everyone, for uh, listening in here. Please share this with uh, a family and loved one so they can learn more about uh, nutrition and, and health and, and how they can make these great meals and start that work.